Loch Yu. Today, peaceful and calm. But during World War II, it was a hive of military activity where the Russian Arctic convoys departed from. From Loch Yu in Scotland, they sailed into the Norwegian Sea and past the perilous Arctic Circle to reach the Russian ports of Murmansk and Archangel. These convoys sailed to Russia, bringing essential supplies, including weapons, to support the Soviet Union in its fight against Nazi Germany. Essential supplies, such as tanks, aircraft, munitions and food, had to get through. To achieve this, sailors from the Allied nations braved terrible conditions, very rough seas and freezing temperatures. Worse still, using their bases in Norway, German attack by air and from the sea was a constant threat, and the sailors had to maintain an ever-vigilant watch. The naval ships escorting these convoys would use every gun at their disposal to repel these attacks, which could come at any time from German U-boats, lurking enemy warships, or from the German Luftwaffe, stationed in occupied Norway. Keeping Russia in the war was essential to the Allied victory over Nazi Germany, and it was imperative that these convoys got through. Newsreels at the cinema played an important role in keeping the British public informed about the progress of the war. This is how Pathé News presented the story in 1942. Northwards to the Arctic Circle rides the convoy and escort bound for ports in northern Russia. Over 2,000 miles of dangerous waters traversing the hard route that leads to Murmansk and Archangel. Laden with great cargoes of war material from Britain's factories, our ships head up to those northern latitudes carrying the weapons that Russia calls for. Upon the broad shoulders of the Royal Navy is placed the heavy and perilous task of getting the supplies to their destinations. Apart from the many hazards of war faced by the men who take the ships to the Soviet, they have to bear the full rigors of Arctic weather. And when the temperature drops far below zero, so intense is the cold that metal on the upper decks and the guns burns the flesh from their hands. Notwithstanding this, ceaseless watch is kept at all times of day and night. Out of the dim light of approaching night, an enemy bomber discovers the convoy, and in the gathering gloom comes into attack. But the British Bulldog is very much awake. which Britain is giving to the Soviet is no light thing to be brushed aside. As her ally, we are fulfilling our obligations and will continue to do so until the Nazis are finally obliterated by the United Nations. I'd like to welcome the veterans of the Russian Arctic convoys, their families, and everyone watching this in the United Kingdom, Russia, and around the world. Я хотел бы приветствовать ветеранов русских арктических конвоев, их семьи и всех тех, кто принимали участие в этой встрече в Соединенном Королевстве, в России и повсюду в мире. Last year marked the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War and the last Russian Arctic convoy to leave Loch U on the west coast of Scotland. The convoys were made up of naval and merchant ships ferrying munitions and supplies across the Arctic Ocean to Archangel and Murmansk for the Eastern Front. Last year's planned memorial event on the shores of Loch Hugh had to be postponed due to COVID, but it's hoped that it will now take place in May 2022. The heroism of those involved in the Russian Arctic convoys 
must never be forgotten, not only by those of us in the United Kingdom. We must also remember the invaluable contribution of our allies, including the Commonwealth and the United States, who, by working together with Russia during World War II, can be proud to share with them a history of achievement and brotherhood. 3,000 sailors from the Royal and Merchant Navies sailed from the west coast of Scotland, as well as from Liverpool and Iceland, to ports in northern Russia deep in the Arctic Circle. In all, 78 hazardous round trips were undertaken, with the convoys against all the odds successfully shipping 4 million tonnes of much-needed supplies to Russia. More than 120 ships within these convoys were sunk by the German Navy and Air Force with a loss of 2,700 lives. And as if the relentless enemy attacks on the convoys were not enough, the appalling weather also played a treacherous part with very rough seas and perilous ice that affected navigation and the stability of the ships because of the added weight topsides. Our Prime Minister Winston Churchill described these voyages as the worst journey in the world. In 2013, I had the privilege to award the Russian Arctic Star to many British Commonwealth veterans who travelled to the shores of Loch U to receive this recognition of their contribution to the war effort, who had served in the harsh conditions of the Arctic Circle. There couldn't have been a more symbolic location. On Remembrance Day each year, I watched with great pride as the dwindling number of mariners who served on the Arctic convoys marched past the Cenotaph in London. We should never forget the extraordinary bravery and sacrifices made by them and by so many of their colleagues and countrymen of all nations. We should remember their sacrifice. The events of the Russian Arctic convoys took place over 75 years ago, but surviving veterans from around the globe recall their vivid memories. I was drafted ashore at midnight on the end of December 43 from HMS Arty. My action station was at the stern releasing depth charges. 29 days after I left, she was on her next run to Murmansk. U-boat 278 fired one of the latest German torpedoes, which were acoustic. And she struck the stern of Hardy and blew the stern off. So my 12 close mates were written off on the 29th of, of January, 1944. That colored my life, frankly. You yourself have uh, quite a chest full of medals there yourself, including, uh, did I see the Arctic Star? Could we perhaps see your medals? If you did time in World War II, from six months on, you were awarded these. And of course, at the end are the other medals, are the Russian medals. I view them as terribly important. So the only really important one is the Arctic Star. But it strikes me that... Uh, Peace comes, memories fade, the public has other priorities, all understandable. Remembering them is the least that I could do in memory of people who paid the price. I went to this Empire plowman, sailed up to uh, Scotland. The convoy gathered there. The weather was very bad as a 60, 70 mile an hour gale. 
there was 14 ships in the convoy near Bear Island. And that's where we were attacked by 10 U-boats, the sounds, the torpedoes, the, the uh, depth charges were the worst. I, was, I went deaf for quite a while because I was below decks when uh, a depth charge went off. The Commodore ship was sunk and we were the vice Commodore ship. Terrible. The amount of people that died and uh, the ships that were sunk. There's something that never leaves me. Uh, I, I've never, I never forgot. When we got to Archangel, there was a, a, the traffic was going across the ice and there was a policeman in the middle conducting it and he directed the traffic aside while the icebreaker went through and I went to the stern of the ship and it was only a matter of uh, well five minutes and uh, the ice just came back together and the traffic came up straight away that's how cold it was cold. she was <laughs> The largest convoy ever taken to Russia is feeling its way through the danger belt north of Scandinavia. This is the Roof of the World route, which saw an Arctic sea battle between Nazi bombers, mine layers, packs of torpedo droppers and submarines, and the strong escort of ships and planes which screened the great armada of freighters taking their precious cargoes to the relief of Russia. But about a week, the savage enemy assault went on in an attempt to wipe out the staggering tonnage of weapons and supplies which even the Germans described as enough to equip an army. Aboard the convoy flagship Scylla, Lieutenant Commander McKean keeps up a running commentary on the battle for the benefit of the ship's company. Down below the water line, stokers and engineers hear an account of the inferno that's going on as a merciless fire is hurled against the attacking aircraft. Flying mast high, the Germans were pumping out torpedoes from waves of aircraft coming down from their northern bases. This is the steel-spattered hell through which British, American and Russian freighters went. Those gallant merchantmen didn't get through the attack without loss. A pillar of black smoke hangs motionless, marking the spot where one of the convoy gave its life for Russia. An amazing feat of navigation was performed when two of the escort ships came alongside each other and were lashed together while traveling at speed. The minesweeper Harrier was thus able to transfer survivors from a torpedoed freighter onto the cruiser Scylla. The same thing was repeated later. A difficult feat in peacetime, but with an icy wind blowing and the enemy overhead, it was a superhuman job. When the convoy had passed the danger zone, the commander of the naval escort, Rear Admiral Burnett, decided that the Scylla had better go on ahead with the survivors. This is how that cheerful admiral was slung aboard the destroyer, which was then to carry his flag. So splendidly had his guarding warships dealt with the Luftwaffe's fifth air fleet, that none ventured out to attack on the homeward journey. Danger there was in plenty. Lurking U-boats had still to be fought. But the man who guarded the convoys sailed on and won. So I volunteered for the Navy in 1941. And you were drafted onto the convoys. What did you serve on? Well, I served on the Flag Lance Corvette. You know, they were only 203 feet long and they were built on the um, shape of an Arctic Icelandic trawler. So they were great sort of sea boats, but they were shockers and in. in rough weather or, or as somebody said they would roll on wet grass but you know they had a crew to start with we only had 50 men on board and then that was increased to 90 by the time we started the um, Russian convoys but that mostly for anti-submarine work really we had a four inch gun on the bow that was made in 1918 um, but it did, it was useful, but it made a hell of a lot of noise. Uh, we were assigned as the close escort for PQ-18. 
which had 40 merchant ships. It was a very big convoy and it was the most heavily defended uh, of the war, really, apart from the Malta convoys, which of course were pretty heavily defended as well. But so, yeah, so there was a close escort of four corvettes, some destroyers and trawlers. We also had an aircraft carrier with us mm -hmm. and a cruiser, the Scylla. And the Scylla had the um, commanding officer in charge of the whole convoy uh, on board here. Yeah. It was frightening, there's no doubt about that. You know, the first time uh, we had 40, altogether 40 torpedo bombers coming over like a swarm of locusts at about four or 500 feet above the water, almost like masthead height almost. And the Commodore of the convoy decided to turn the whole convoy to face the torpedo bombers. So he hoisted the signal for the turn to starboard but the two outer starboard columns, for some reason, didn't get the signal, or they were too busy looking at the um, torpedo bombers to do anything. And so they lost, I think it was eight ships straight away from the torpedo bombers. Um, and yeah, that was pretty, I always remember coming up on the deck, uh, I'd been down below for something, and uh, oh, I came out of the wireless office, and I had to go up on the bridge, and I looked across and saw these planes, these torpedo bombers coming across. And I started counting and I counted up to about 23, I think it was. And I stopped counting. <laughs> we did have um, one pretty horrendous storm. And um, when you get storms up in that Barents Sea, of course, it can be bad. I remember one convoy, we actually, the whole convoy and escorts had to eave too for 24 hours because it was too rough. Um, to proceed um, and the little ship like the Corvette you know you've no idea and when you're down below we had bunks to sleep in which was luxurious I suppose but when you felt the ship rolling so many times I've got out of my we all have got out of our bunks stood by the side holding on and thinking you know is it going to come back again and it would roll so badly and then Finally, it would come back. Yeah. I was lucky I was never seasick. 14 days after we left uh, from Lock U, and we arrived um, in Archangel in very, very rough weather. It was horrendous. Um, but we did go into Archangel, and the Bluebell was detailed off to stay there. We stayed there for a couple of months, I think it was, sort of being a duty boat. You know, we ran messages. We had to do all sorts of different things. And uh, we did also go round to um, Murmansk, to the uh, Russian naval base of Polyano, uh, which was quite a, an eye-opener for us because they put on a, a wonderful concert for us there. All so right. people to say the Russians weren't friendly. I'm afraid I have to disagree. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't a natural thing to do, to go to sea and fight. And I think as I've always said, my admiration really is for the merchant navy, because those men on those merchant ships, and I've seen them sinking, and it was a horrible sight. But, you know, they, they were doing their peacetime work mm -hmm. day by day, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they were confronted with the war, and they carried on their peacetime work, but um, in battle. So my memories really are so strong of those um, merchant navy guys and the ships that they were in. As I say, having seen several of them blow up uh, in front of your eyes, it was a horrible sight. Um, we weren't allowed to rescue um, survivors because there were designated rescue ships that went with the convoys. Um, I'm very grateful that I survived and I'm sorry that the skipper who recommended me for the commission that I went to, back to England to try and get. Um, he died with the ship, unfortunately. But yeah, it was, a, it was a hard life, but I think it did me a power of good. I went to sea as an apprentice in the merchant service in 1940, just at the time of Dunkirk. Well, I, I, I went up in February 1943, and I did not leave Russia till 
at the end of November 1943, we were in what was called the Forgotten Convoy. Uh, you see, the days were beginning to get lighter. And after we got into Russia, I think they decided it was getting too light. Uh, that was in the end of February. It was getting too light to risk a convoy in the way up. So they just forgot us and we had to survive as best we could. And we also had malnutrition and uh, but very fortunate though we were bought, uh, anchored for three months within 10 kilometers of the German lines and were attacked nearly every day. But we had the ship damaged and when 10 got stuck together and back out again. But we only had one man wounded when we lost nobody off our ship. I, I lost a friend off in our ship, but that was, that was the way it was. As I say, we were anchored within 10 kilometers of the German lines. And we, we got bombed one day and the bomb went through the deck. I was blown up. And when I landed, fortunately, on deck instead of going over the side, uh, when I, when I struggled back to my feet, there was a nice round hole in the steel deck within three yards of where I was lying. And it happened to be one of the bombs that hadn't gone off. And it's the only one that didn't go off in the whole period we were there. So I, I wasn't meant to die at that time. But we were unfortunate. We ran into a hurricane. And we lost four or five merchant ships and one aircraft carrier. HMS Dasher and uh, one cruiser HMS Suffolk, I think it was. They were all damaged by the weather. We we hung on, we lost most of our deck cargo and we and we had some damage done to the ship, but we kept going and we got there eventually. We were attacked. The, the first big attack we had after the hurricane, were, when we were picking up the stick and the bits together again, was 21 Junker GU-88s, and then after that we were attacked by 21 Henkel 111s, and uh, it was a difficult, difficult attack, the ship was damaged, and my job, I can tell you about that, I, I was just a junior spouse, and I had to be with the captain out in the open air on all the fighting so that he could see all around, and I had to be able to read signals from any, any ships close to us. And I, I was responsible for all visual signals. And I had to be able to see all around and see, you know, not, not under shelter at all. You were on the open. So you saw everything that was coming to you. Not very pleasant at times. After we discharged our cargo, we had to go away from the keys to make room for other ships to discharge the cargo. And they anchored about five of us in a row, just at a place, a place called Mazukabo Anchorage just at the edge of it, and it, this suited the Germans. It was wonderful because the five ships, or where it was, it was more, really, five ships at anchor, no steam, no nothing. <laughs> and they, they used to enjoy attacking us about once a day. The worst day we had was three attacks, but that was an exception. That was only one we had that. And we had, we had the ship damaged a few times, went back into to dock and got stuck together and went back out and got damaged again. But, that was the way life was, and you just accepted it. We lost 3,000 men on the convoys. Uh, I think it was 2,000 Royal Navy men. And there was, fortunately, we lost, a hundred, lost 104 merchant ships sunk in the, in the Bahrain Sea and the, the, the Arctic Ocean. And we lost, we lost up about 1,000 men. You see, merchant ships had much smaller crews than the lack of naval ships. Uh, imagine if we had 57 men, and as we call them, 57 different varieties. <laughs> we had 22 gunners between the Maritime Regiment Royal Artillery Gunners, who manned the Beauforts, and Dems Gunners, that's defensively equipped merchant ships, who manned the Orlicans and the small arms stuff. And, uh, that, that, that was the way it was. So, so that's why there's an uneven number because the Navy lose a cruiser and a cruiser has a crew, I'm only I'm guessing, uh, roughly about 800,000 men on it. Look at the route they had to take past that jagged coast of Nazi occupied Norway with its countless fjord concealing new boats supported by air bases from which hundreds of dive bombers, high level bombers, and torpedo bombers can take off. 
a voyage of more than 2,000 miles, and nearly all of it in the enemy's own hunting ground. What was life like on board on the Arctic convoys? Because Churchill described it as the worst journey in the world. You know, it depended on the weather and the enemy. And um, if the weather was too bad, of course, you don't have to bother with the enemy because they're suffering like you are. Coming back on 64 is a very well-known convoy because a lot happened then. Uh, we were called to um, rescue the survivors of the SS Henry Bacon mm -hmm. that was actually sailing full speed away from the convoy, so it wasn't helpful. But then she got sunk, and at least that stopped her. And um, we were about 50 miles away, so it took us quite a long time. The light was going. It goes quickly in that, the Arctic mm -hmm. in February. And we had hurricane force winds officially. The biograph, which measures the pressure, has a needle that goes up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was off the bottom. And it was off the bottom on several ships. A HMS Opportune picked up um, the odd boats. But we got some men out of the water. In and they were nearly frozen stiff. They were just about at the end. They couldn't move. They had to be thawed out. Clothing had to be cut off them. And the last one of those, Dick Burbine, is still alive in the States. Um, he's the last one from the ship that's still alive. So it wasn't a great trip, that. I have described it, actually, as one of the two worst days of my life. Otherwise, in a routine convoy, the worst thing was sleep deprivation, as we now call it, dog tired, as we would call it, and the bread, trying to eat mildewed bread, because destroyers don't bake. And so by the time you're getting towards Russia, it may be white in Russia, but the bread's quite green. <laughs> the Russian nation were obviously quite appreciative and grateful for it, because they, they struck the Yushikov medal, which I see you wear on your blazer. Yes, yes, that's this one. It's the, uh, the three Russian ones. It's a top medal in Russia. It's a very fine one to receive. Modern Russia still remembers and honours the sacrifice of the men who sailed on the Arctic convoys. It's a great honour for me to take part in, the, in this documentary to commemorate one of the, of the great act of bravery in modern history performed by the members of the legendary Arctic convoys who took vital supplies from the elite countries to the Soviet Union during the Second World War. Undertaking the most uh, dangerous journey in the world, as it was described by Sir Winston Churchill, more than 3,000 uh, sailors, Royal Navy and merchant seamen sacrificed their lives, delivering more than 4 million tons of supplies, tanks, fighters, trucks, fuel, ammunition and food. Around 1,400 merchant ships sailed to ports in northern Russia during 78 convoys. Some 85 merchant ships never made it, nor did uh, 16 Royal Navy warship, which provided efforts for them in the face of attacks from the German vessels, U-boats and Luftwaffe, where the Consulate General of Russia give the most importance uh, to preserving the legacy of the Arctic convoy celebrating our, our joint efforts to anticipate the victory. We were privileged with this mission of presenting highly esteemed Russian military award the Admiral Ushakov Medal, personally to almost 200 veterans of the Arctic convoys. And the latest decoration took place just a few days ago. Annually celebrating the victory over Nazism, we are rediscovering all the enormity of this effort. We are proud that it's our fathers and grandfathers who managed to overpower and destroy this absolute evil. However, let me quote Russian writer Sergei Tolstoy, who once wrote, we should learn about our fathers and their fathers, not to be proud of them, but to be worthy of them. I'm quite certain that the importance of this lesson of history is even stronger today when the rising populism driving the ideology of hatred back to our hearts and minds, be it in the form of attempts to rewrite history and the outcome of the Second World War or any other pretext. The memories of that war are sacred in my country, 
which pay the heavy toll for their victory. We should remember that in the darkest hour, our nation stood shoulder to shoulder. I would like to thank the film crew and all the participants of the documentary for the efforts to make to preserve the memory of the Arctic Conway and our common victory. Thank you. The ghosts of Loch Hu and the Arctic convoys remain with us. But today, it is a place of pilgrimage for the many who want to remember the bravery of those involved and keep the memories alive. The BBC Landward programme recently visited the site and interviewed the co-chairman of the Russian Arctic Convoy Project and Museum. This is Loch Yu, a remote corner of the Northwest Highlands, where crofters had farmed and fished quietly for generations. But when Britain declared war on Germany in September 1939, all of that changed. Good morning. Good morning, how are you sir? Fine. Nice to see you. And nice. you too, yeah. Sure, sure, have a wee wander along. Why not, it's a beautiful day. It is a beautiful day, absolutely is. This tranquil sea loch became a key location for the British Navy. Historian Francis Russell explains why. It goes back to the First World War, when it was a sort of an alternate anchorage, not, not base, but to Scarpa Flow. Uh -huh. And because of its location, and it's got a narrow entrance, it's broad and it's deep, and so easily defended in case of need. And is there still evidence of that these days? Oh, there is ample evidence all around the loch, and we can go and have a look at it. As the war effort increased, the anchorage at Loch Hugh was defended with everything from anti-submarine mines to anti-aircraft batteries. You've got six-inch gun emplacements, uh -huh. gunnery direction tower. Wow, look at this place. Yep, this is an old observation tower. Uh-huh. Post. My goodness, look at that view. Yeah, and here we are. Wow. The mouth of the loch. You get a real sense of everything that's going on here. What a yeah. place to put it. You can see now why, because it's narrow. Yeah. And the anti-submarine boom went just down where that's a small island and it crossed over to the other side. There used to be many, many, many ships in here at one time. So Francis, this area was clearly well protected. What was going on here? When Russia entered the war after the German invasion, Churchill decided to help Russia, and the only way to do it was to send war material by convoys. And so convoys would assemble here. They'd come up from Liverpool, Glasgow, and from the States and Canada. It was said you could almost cross the loch walking on the decks of the merchant ships. They were loaded with everything from tanks and aircraft to food supplies. And in a series of perilous missions, Royal Navy warships would escort them on their way to the Russian ports of Murmansk and Archangel. There were 19 convoys sailed from Loch Hu, say 30 ships per convoy. Winston Churchill described the Russian convoys as the worst journey in the world. Why were they so dangerous? If you look at some of the Royal Navy ships, they had open bridges. And so sailing in Arctic waters with freezing ice, they were always chipping ice off the ship so they didn't turn turtle. And under fire as well. And under fire, from above, from below. Over 100 ships were lost from the convoys and their escorts that sailed from Loch Hu. The human cost must have been huge then. Over 3,000 sailors lost their lives. But when you talk to the veterans, they're very matter-of-fact about it. Well, just doing our job, which is what they were doing, of course, but um, incredible people. This was a small campaign, but it was a crucial campaign for the outcome of the war. But keeping those stories alive is hugely important. Oh, it is. Keeping those stories of the individuals, their heroism, and not just on our side, but on the other side as well. Because they were all human beings, after all, and, and doing their jobs.
These days, Loch Hugh is still used by the Navy. And all around us, there are reminders of the people who came and served here during World War II and those who never returned. The Arctic Convoy Memorial and the Russian Arctic Convoy Project and Exhibition Centre at Loch Hugh play important roles today in preserving history as a visitor attraction. There was very little that Britain could do in the summer of 1941 to take the pressure off the Russians. But my grandfather was determined to send aid. Hence the Arctic convoys were born. And he remained a leading advocate of these operations throughout the conflict. My grandmother Clementine also gave her support with her leadership and patronage of the Red Cross Aid to Russia Fund. They both recognised how vital it was to keep Russia in the war and to keep her pushing back against Hitler's advances. He could see the advantages of helping and the potential consequences if the Allies did not come to Russia's aid. He knew that his enemy's enemy was his friend, or, as he memorably put it, to his private secretary, Jock Colville, if Hitler invaded hell, I would at least make a favourable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. He and Roosevelt knew that by ensuring that Russia did not sue for peace and that Hitler's army and the Luftwaffe were kept busy on the Eastern Front, some pressure would be taken off the other theatres of war. It was a vital distraction for Hitler's forces. My grandfather described the Arctic convoys as the worst journey in the world. Four million tonnes of armaments and materials were sent between 1941 and 1945, but at a considerable cost. It must have been the most horrendous journey for the sailors. They were not just fighting the enemy, they were having a fearful battle with the elements. Ice had to be constantly chipped off the ship's superstructure to prevent it making the vessel top-heavy and turning turtle in the freezing waters of the Arctic. And if a ship went down, the next merchant ship in the convoy was not allowed to stop and pick up survivors. As my grandfather later wrote, when Soviet Russia was attacked by Hitler, the only way we and the Americans could help them was by sending weapons and supplies. These were given on a grand scale from United States and British production and from American munitions already given to Britain. The equipment of our ravenous armies was therefore heavily smitten and all effective preparations against an impending attack by Japan made virtually impossible. In other words, we supported Russia to our detriment. I think history recognises that he made the right choice in keeping the Soviet Union fighting on the Eastern Front. Tied up Hitler's resources, weakened his military capability elsewhere and contributed to the ending of the war. It's also a classic example of my grandfather's single-mindedness that he insisted on maintaining these convoys even when some within his cabinet were calling for them to end. When he was convinced of something, he was not afraid to make unpopular choices if he truly believed them to be right. Perhaps it was especially courageous given his previously well-known dislike and distrust of communism. He famously said, courage is the greatest of all human qualities because it is the one that guarantees all the others. He certainly had courage in his actions over the Arctic convoys. In memory of the many sailors from the UK and around the world who sailed from Loch Hugh, 100 small silhouetted ships have been created and placed side by side, looking out to the very waters that the convoys set sail from over 75 years ago in a poignant and reflective memorial. Those same waters remain as dramatic and bewitching today as they did during the dark days of World War II. As we look out, and as the surviving veterans look out, we all collectively share the experiences of the many Russian Arctic convoy veterans who are no longer with us.
we pay our respects to the many veterans of the Russian Arctic convoys in a poignant ceremony on the shoreline of Loch Yu. A shoreline once heavy with anticipation, fear and excitement. Now, quiet, reflective and respectful. John Casson, MBE, co-chairman, talks about the Russian Arctic Convoy project and future plans for their museum. Today you would have learnt more about the Russian Arctic convoys that left here, Loch Hugh in Scotland, during World War II. I personally can't imagine what it would have been like to have been on those convoys. It is important that we don't forget that sacrifice. Winston Churchill during the war said that it was the worst journey in the world how right that was. On the shores of Loch Hugh, we have the Russian Arctic Convoy Project and Museum, a museum that is dedicated to that sacrifice. We would like to extend that museum and we would also like to secure its future. I'm asking you please to make a donation to our museum to allow us to continue the good work that we're doing to ensure that the sacrifice made by so many is never ever forgotten. Thank you.